Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome. My name is Matt Bailey. I'm the National Ambassador for the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. Um, thank you so much for joining me in stream tonight um, to talk all things about flavour and benchmarking. Now, this is a bit of a complicated subject, and I want, I want to preface by saying that this is definitely a, a bit of a nerdy subject uh, to delve into. So, happy Wednesdays to you all. If you caught um, the Monday stream, that wasn't even that wasn't even a rant. It was just a discussion. It was good. Tuesday last night was Whiskey Roundtable which uh, I really enjoyed and I, I love being a part of it was Mark Westmoreland from uh, from Wolfburn Distillery. I've, I said Westmoreland, I almost said from Westland, uh, but it's not from Westland. The reason I said Westland is because of the topic in tonight's stream. However, um, what I wanted to um, what I want to make mention of tonight is the um, – tonight is talking about benchmarking and um, flavor compounds and a few things I want to touch on like that. Now, the reason I'm going into this detail is because – it was actually a um, it was a comment that Andrew Durbage made, our cellar master. Now, I'm going to start here. Okay, I'm going to grab this glass, our society spirits tasting glass. Pardon me, and I'm going to pour a little bit of this. Now, I'll explain why in just a moment. So, I hope you're all joining with me for a dram, by the way. Just going to pour a tiny bit of that, just a taster of it. Okay, something that Andrew said um, during. Um, uh, during the broadcast on Friday night of our live stream was he was talking about the, um, he, he picked, he, he, he had a taste of this. Oh, make sure that's coming up in the light there. It's 134.7, a dreamer's dram. It's a five-year-old single cask whiskey from India. Uh, it's his distillery 134. So it's fairly late in our coding system. Indian whiskeys are quite new to the society. It's one of 215 bottles from the whole cask. It's a second Felix bourbon barrel. And it's one of the most delightful young whiskies I've ever had. One of the even the discussion one of the discussion points last night uh, was about how young whiskey is performing better than ever, and that um, people are uh, I guess whiskey drinkers, whiskey consumers are becoming more uh, educated and knowledgeable on what's happening with young whiskey and how it can perform really well. Um, I want us to do a shout out to Zach Bowen, Rob Akers, Darren Howie, Philip Zach. Alex Dahlenberg, everyone who's tuning in tonight, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to grab some of the comments on screen, of course, as well. Um, nerdy, excellent, says Rob Akers. Thank you so much, Rob. So this is this is something I wanted to just touch on tonight was about was talking a little bit more in depth about uh, flavor and benchmarking. Now, when Andrew poured this whiskey on Friday night, the first thing he said when he knows this exact whiskey was, wow, you can really smell the malt in that. Now, that's something I want to touch on. He said you can smell the malt, and I completely agree with him. I've got here some um, malted barley, slightly milled as well, actually, this one, uh, mistakenly. Um, if you're ordering malted barley, don't order it milled. It just makes more of a mess at tastings. Now, I'm just going to... Ooh, bit of bit of uh, malt smoke coming out of that glass. I'm just going to have a smell and taste of this barley. If anyone here has been to a distillery before, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about with this. If you get an opportunity to taste barley, um, do so. It's really interesting. There's so many different strains of barley. And this is something that is one of the flavor compounds I want to talk about. So we're talking about malt. We're talking about spirit character. And we're talking about wood. Just very much an overview, but it will get a little bit nerdy along the way. Where's the cork gone? Here we go. Pop the cork back in my barley bottle here. An old uh, peat fairy bottle that's been repurposed into my barley storage facility. Um so I'm also going to pour just a bit of new make. I have on hand some Archie Rose new make. It's very easy to get because uh, the distillery is 10 minutes away. Okay, so here we go. So I've got a bit of new make in the glass and I've got a bit of whiskey in this glass. Now I know I appreciate that I'm nosing, um, I appreciate that I'm nosing new make uh, from Australia and tasting Indian whiskey, but bear with me. So. I've also got a screen share. I'm going to try and screen share with you something as well, quite interesting. Um, whilst I do that, um, and that's that's something that I'm going to find you're going to find quite interesting in the fact that talking about flavor and benchmarking, as I've, as I've said, what I what do I mean by benchmarking? I mean some of the the uh, fundamental characters of what a whiskey should taste like. Now, that's not to say that you can't break the rules and create something that is you know uh, far more interesting or however you want to run it. But what I'm saying is um, it's quite important. Um, I guess 
to reach certain benchmarks before you even start talking about those end flavors. Malt is, of course, one of them. The importance of the malt character in the spirit. That's really important. So um, big shout out to Alan Jung and Hayden Dare. Thank you so much for joining in tonight. Jeff Fuel, Jeff, Jeff, hope you're well, mate. Been a while. Linus Schlaxman, Andy Bunting, good to see you guys. Oh, wow. I'm honored with your presence. Thank you so much. Uh, Adrian Graham, good to see you guys. Giuseppe Vitano, Irina, Nick Huzek, thank you so much. Um, if you comment, I get to, I see the comments and I'll even throw them up on screen, unless they're rude, in which case I won't. There you go. There's Darren Howie. So some of the things I wanted to touch on tonight was uh, talking about, uh, as I say, benchmarking. Now, the malt is one of them. At a distillery, you might get a chance to taste it. I've poured some into a glass here for you to see. This is malted barley. Now, for those who are whiskey beginners, this might be a bit of a revelation to you, but others it won't be. But this is the this is the sort of the backbone of what makes whiskey. Malted barley, water, and yeast. Now, if you combine those three ingredients, you get a wash, and you're gonna turn it, in, you're gonna have a beer, which you're gonna then distill. Um, that beer needs to ferment and needs to bubble away and create all those flavor compounds. Where does and then it turns into our new make. I'm not talking about distillation tonight, so I'm not gonna go too much into this, but it turns into new make. And then that new make is the the Ba uh, the backbone of what is then filled into the backbone is the spirit that is filled into the casks. Let's start with flavor compounds. Um, so let's start with, I'm going to just bring up something here. I've got some notes I want to make sure I'm, I don't, I'm not ref missing anything here. Okay, so first of all, when you nose a whiskey, when Andrew nosed it the other night, he smelled malt. Now what's bouncing off the, in the inside of that glass right now, which is why appropriate glassware makes a lot of sense for drinking, for appreciating whiskey, I should say, Drinking whiskey, you can drink it out of a shoe for all I care. Appreciating whiskey takes a different level of, um, um, is a different level. And that's something really important. So we, when, we're, when we're nosing uh, whiskey, we are perceiving the volatile aromas off the glass. So imagine right now I'm holding this glass and just above where the spirit ends are all the volatile aromas building up in that bulb there. You've got to give them a bit of room. One of the reasons why I always recommend adding water to whiskey is because it releases a lot of those volatile compounds, uh, pardon me, the aromas off the top, and it allows you to experience the malt and the whiskey. I haven't tasted this yet, but I know it's 61.0% on the head. It's an Indian single cask, single malt whiskey, this one. From a Scotch malt whiskey society, I'm very aware of that. <laughs> uh, yes, Rob, of course, you got on the screen for that one, so you win again. Um, but it's, the importance of those volatile aromas is it's very good because obviously you can nose a lot of whiskeys. Uh, you can't taste a lot of whiskeys. If you're doing appreciation, if you're tasting quite a few things, your uh, palate will become fatigued very quickly. Uh, I find that even after five or six whiskeys, you'll start seeing proper palate, palate, palate fatigue, uh, which means that you're going to lose some of those nuances to the spirit and you'll just end up getting sloshed. We recommend drinking responsibly. However, with the... Um, uh, with volatile aromas, you can actually uh, capture a lot of those, the essence of the sense of what's going inside the glass. So let's, um, okay. So let's have a look at three of those volatile aromas that you can, that we're dr drilling down on here in some of the benchmarking, if you like, of assessment and appreciation of whiskey. One is basic tastes, things like sweet, sour, bitter, things like that. So you're getting like, is it sweet? Is it sour? Is it bitter? Some of those things are desirable characteristics. Some are undesirable. Uh, then, then it's course, of course, it's volatile aromas, which I've just touched on. Those are things like um, black currant, spicy notes, uh, green peppers, uh, chili, uh, things that are in that sort of realm, um, or sort of like quite like uh, rich dark sugar notes. Those kind of things. Those those are going to be much more volatile notes that come off the spirit. <laughs> uh, Darren says, uh, made after six full cast strength drams, I'm losing more than just my uh, palate. Depends how much you drink, Darren. Of course, I recommend even just having a, I've poured about, seriously, about 10 mils into that glass. And it's performing very nicely with a few drops of water right there. Okay. So um, the, then there's the chemical feeling factors within the whiskey. Things like uh, trigeminal sensors. So those are things where you get like a heat, burn, irritation, menthol notes, uh, and tactile sensations, things like astringency and smoothness. So those are more related to mouthfeel rather than um, uh, rather than actual sort of volatiles. So there's flavor compounds and there's the mouthfeel and the mouthful ones are more tactile, uh, things that you can sort of say, oh, that tastes silky or that tastes, uh, has a smoothness to the spirit. It sort of rolls off the tongue or it's, or it's got a lot of chili acid burn to it, to the palate. 
and it all, you know, those kind of really dry whiskies that I sometimes love that are kind of grippy um, on the inside of the mouth. Love them. You know what? For saying that, uh, Mal, you're up on screen, mate. Smooth. Yes, exactly. Smooth is a banned word at my tastings. Um, it's not banned. Look, it just means that we've, we've got to do better. And I'm going to screen share a, a actual a flavor wheel for us all to see, actually. Probably the best flavor wheel for um, whiskey assessment and appreciation in the world. And this is something that I've been doing a lot of work on in, in building my receptors, building up my palate for uh, the better appreciation and understanding of flavor compounds in whiskey. So let's have a look at what the flavor compounds mean. We've got, if I'm going to read this verbatim, the ASTM uh, International defines flavor as the perception resulting from stimulating a combination of the taste buds, olfactory organs, and chemesthetic receptors within the oral cavity. The combined effect of taste sensations, aromatics, and chemical feeling factors evoked by a substance in the oral cavity. Look, that's really straightforward. That's almost the textbook definition there. But for us, it's the appearance, the aroma, the primary tastes in the mouthfeel. As I said before, the appearance, of course, isn't part of the flavor, but it's, it's we look at that whiskey. We like we like to look at the color of that whiskey. Color doesn't tell us anything um, about a whiskey. Uh, it just tells us it's got color, and that color is, is actually brought in from the cask, in our case. Some distillery is at E150. I've talked about E150 on the stream before, so I'm not going to delve into that. Tonight's about benchmarking and flavor, and this is kind of a bit of a nerdy subject, and I know I know I'm um, I'm digging into it a bit fast here. I want to also mention that it's actually something I um uh, I want to mention something which I, before I even meant to start this stream, I'm probably going to um what's the word for it? Uh, I, I'm probably going to split this up into a couple of streams because. Uh, this will be sort of the first night tonight and we'll delve into it a bit deeper in the next few nights or maybe next week. See how we go. Now, great question. I'm going to answer questions as we go. So throw them into the chat thread. Do volatiles and aromas, etc., all apply to non-whiskey spirits? Yes, they do, Nick. They just react very differently in different ways and the flavor wheels are different for them and the uh, the chemical reactions are often different. So they they all they all apply and the, and the volatiles are part of all spirits or part of all wine or part of all beer. Of course, higher proof means the higher volatile range. So it means the range is higher, which is why whiskey has so much flavor, um, which is why wine has more flavor than beer generally in nosing. And uh, whiskey has more flavor than wine in nosing uh, because, and you can, pardon me, you can learn a lot from nosing a spirit. Like I, I learn 90% about what I need to know about a whiskey from nosing it. Sometimes uh, the nose and the palate don't match up. They don't, they're not talking to each other. They're very different. The nose is one thing and the palate is something different. And sometimes the mouthfeel will absolutely shock you in, a, in different ways, which I love. I love that exploration because in some cases, I'm sure you might recall, I've talked about this once before. If I've had some whiskeys before that are 41, 44% ABV, quite low, like just above the 40 range, and they taste hot and prickly and grippy and they're not they're not much fun to drink they're interesting to assess and um and to evaluate if you like and appreciate but they're not really much to uh enjoy i've had some whiskies however that are even 65 or 70 percent abv or even sometimes higher uh that were like liquid silk on the palate and that also happens doesn't always happen but when it does it's amazing it's one of those weird uh, occurrences that happen so I hope that's sort of that's a roundabout way of answering your question there, Nick. Um, so aroma, primary tastes, and mouthfeel. So the aroma, of course, is off the nose. The volatiles, the primary tastes are the tastes that, uh, as it rolls around your tongue and your taste buds. And then, of course, the mouthfeel, which is the touch, the touch of how it actually um, jumps across. So, um, of course, we're talking about orthonasal olfaction and retronasal olfaction. So these are things that, these are the aromas that you get across um, across uh, across all sorts of things. Uh, <laughs> proper twelve. Look, Alex. You, you, um, what's what's that line? It's they they call it proper shite. No, no. Look, there's there's a time and place for every whiskey. And um, what do they say? Whiskey's a bit like pizza. Even when it's even when it's bad, it's still okay. There's a time and place for everything. Um, proper twelve is a good example of a whiskey where they um. It's designed for, it's very, very much to be designed as just a, a low flavor mixer, bit of fun. It's the kind of thing you might scull in the park with your friends when you're 17. You know what I mean? It's not really the kind of thing that is um, an exactly exciting whiskey. But as Andy Milne said on one of our streams, he, um, they couldn't keep it in stock when it first released in the UK. It was, 
flying out the doors. So I'm not so elite or you know snobby to to think that it's not an important whiskey. It is. It serves a time and place. It's just not my kind of time or place, and I get that. And probably not for yours either if you're tuning into me, talking to me, listening to about orthonasal olfaction. Uh, as I said, we're nerding out a bit tonight. So um, so then we're going to del- drill drill down into the flavors that you might find. You'll find things that are fruity, estery, uh, diacetyl, which is buttery notes, uh, sulfury, so maybe rotten vegetable notes, and I, re- prefer, and I prefer not to drink those. Smoky notes, peated notes, green and grassy notes, spicy notes, Leathery notes, vanilla notes. There's so and there's and then you drill down another layer from there, and you get uh, all sorts of things going on there. And it's it is actually it's quite incredible. So how is your how is your flavor then? How do you make sure that your palate is calibrated? Uh, this is another whole other stream, by the way. But how do you calibrate your palate to be able to best enjoy that? Um, they could be things like genetics. Genetics plays a huge role. That, that, that's that's fact. So um, you know it's. Uh, and generally speaking, uh, women are better at men than men in nosing and appreciating whiskey. They have a, a higher olfactory sensor than men. I don't, I'm getting my wording wrong, but they have more more taste buds, whatever it is. So, um, and that's that's just that's just a genetic fact. That's a DNA fact. Uh, but also, your genetics, your personal genetics, play, plays a huge role, huge role in how you uh, perceive flavors and and qualities. Um, <laughs> is that is that a hand up for a question there, Alex? You can ask anything you like. Um, so culture and dietary experience. So, um, what you've, the foods you've grown up on, the flavors you've exposed yourself to, the, the culture, the food culture that you've surrounded yourself in. Um, I'm guessing people who have grown up perhaps, um, uh, <laughs> depending on whether you've, you've grown up in Australia or Brazil or Scandinavia, you've, you've had, um, different, um, yeah, different cultural and s- different sensitivities to those kind of things. And of course, inherent uh, day-to-day variation of your palate. Your palate changes every day. That's a fact. A whiskey you taste now will taste different tomorrow, will taste different next year, will taste different in 10 years. That's often not the whiskey changing, that's you changing. So that's a really important one to make make mention of as well. By the way, you can anyone watching can interrupt me at any time and ask some cool questions if you've got them, because I, I'm just dumb. Otherwise, I'll just keep going. Uh, Matt Whisker, good to see you, mate. Bonsoir, whiskey lovers. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Whisker. Good to see you. Um, <laughs> uh, Stephen Dobson, Tim Wilkins, Brett Steele, Pete Visky. Thanks everyone who's been joining in. By the way, I haven't actually had a chance to call you all out. Steve Oates, um, Jared Butler, good to see you, mate. Hope you're well. Ali Barner, hope you're well. Um, so here we go. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna keep going. So let's. Uh, so so a good example of how genetics. I'm just gonna drill into those three for a moment. So I started by saying um, genetics, culture, and dietary experience, and inherent day to day. I'm gonna start with the genetics one just for a moment. Now, the Gen X one could be best described as um, how, why is it that some people love coriander and other people hate it? Now, that's a really good example. How, and I'm sure there's people in the thread right now. Um, oh, there's a comment coming through, um, which I, I can't see because they've not um, they've not put their their details in. Oh, Matt Whisker uh, says, I'm going to put it up on screen for everyone to see. There are two things: being able to discern the aromas and flavors, and then the ability to articulate what you're receiving, i.e., vocabulary. Matt, we're actually getting around to vocabulary. Shortly, I've only been going for 20 minutes, so we're getting there. But it's true. I, I said that before. Let's talk about flavor benchmarks, and, and and I said in the thread about articulation of those. We'll get to that. But talking about genetics for a moment, um, the, it's exit. So some people f- taste coriander and go, "That's soapy. Uh, it's got a soapy note to it, or it's got a really bitter, like biting into a lump of soap." And I I love coriander, so I I don't I don't I don't get that. So therefore, that's that's a perception difference that we have in, individually and genetically defines flavor in spirit as well. And that's why even if you look on an even on a basic level, we all know someone, although I don't think I do anymore, but <laughs> but we all know someone who hates peated whiskey, won't go near the stuff. The smell of it makes them wretch, like, oh, I hate that smell of smoke and peat. Or we've also know people who like hate those sort of leathery notes in whiskey. Then they might find them uh, or undesirable or even spicy. You know, I don't know many people who don't like those big rich spices in a whiskey, but some people don't. Um, and there's all sorts of things. I mean, sweetness is, is a bit different. It's sort of like you find more people uh, like sweet whiskeys than others, but that's okay. Um, so, uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's – and then there's culture – I'll just go on to the second point, cultural and uh, dietary differences, um, how we consume foods and how often we consume, consume them. 
uh, may, may affect the perception of the intensity of the relevant chemical flavor. What that means is uh, if you're someone who eats chilies and garlic in almost every meal, then there's a good chance that um, you're, um, you're, not, you're, not, you're not big on things like, uh, uh, you know, there's going to be, there's, your, your, pro- your perception is probably going to be a bit muted. So that's another one. Uh, I, if, if I'm tasting, if I'm appreciating whiskey, if I'm tasting it and assessing it, I avoid chili and garlic uh, and peppers and pepper based uh, product um, for a good 24 hours before at least. And that's, I find that quite important, but it's, you know, it's, it's up to you. Great question from Darren Harry. Matt, do you think bottles have a prime? By that many, by that I mean many people are talking about neck pour being different to shoulder pour. Ah, oh, good question. Do you think bottles change so significantly over 100 and 200 mils being removed? Darren, it's all, it does actually change the whiskey. Now, I don't know that bottles have a prime or not. Um, there's not, I don't think, I think that the research is still out on that. But I think in terms of, um, uh, neck pour being different to the shoulder pour or you know neck pour being different to the, the base pour kind of thing that is a thing and it works the same in uh, it works the same with a fresh keg of beer you know when like the first pour off a beer keg is kind of a bit uh, hot and acid uh, like sort of like gassy hot and gassy and then the last pour is often a little bit sort of <laughs> last the last pour out of a keg is often a bit metallic and and rusty whereas that middle the middle cut of the of the keg is almost the best kind of thing it's the same with uh, it's the same with um, wine. It's the same with um, that's like you know it's when you first pour a wine versus the sediment at the bottom of a bottle kind of thing, and the same with um, uh, spirit. There is a that that does change, but it's not because of the spirit. It's because of the oxidization of that spirit. So I hope that helps. So basically, what that means is the more air exposure that spirit has. Um, so if there's if like have a look at this bottle, there's probably one drag. I can't know if you can see that on camera. Anyway, I'll point to it. There's about like one and a half drams left in that bottle at most. So that's an example where the uh, that will oxidize much faster, even with a cork in it, because it's still full of air. So the, it'll oxidize faster. Now, I've talked about this very briefly before, but oxidization is not whiskey's enemy. And everyone often treats it as such. It's like, oh, it's, you know, that whiskey's oxidized or it's uh, oxidization is bad. That's why they're tasting different from sh- uh, neck to shoulder pour. With 100 mils missing, you're actually, the oxidization actually often improves the whiskey. Um, not all whiskies, not all, but a lot. A lot of sherry casks, um, a lot of older whiskies, things like that actually uh, improve a little bit after being open, uh, and they just they sort of they sit a bit um, they sit a bit nicer. They aerate a bit more in the bottle. That the oxidization is an effect on the spirit, which mellows it out. That's not a bad thing. The only reason I'd ever be concerned about oxidization is a if it's peated. Uh, peated whiskey seems to have a fairly um, negative effect about being oxidized for a long time. Not negative, but you're going to lose a lot of those top volatiles of the lovely. If you, it was especially if it was a younger Peter whiskey, uh, like a ten year old or eight year old Peter whiskey or something like that, the uh, volatiles often are well and truly vaporized. It's become quite flat, quite flat and uninteresting. Still tastes like a Peter whiskey, but uh, of that, if you recall the, the the first experience with it, and the good example would be something like would be something like an Octomore or a Lafroig. Open a bottle of Lafroig ten is a good example, or a Society Lafroig even. Um, pour you know pour twenty mils into a well thirty mils into a sample bottle if you like, and then uh, at the first pour, and then when you get to the bottom of the bottle, pour your last the last bit of the bottle into glass, and then pour the first bit into another glass, and do a side by side. It's actually quite fascinating how much that spirit changes. Um, and then okay, so um. Here we go. Uh, yeah, exactly. And time of day affects olfactory sensitivity as well. That was something I wanted to touch on. The time of day of which you enjoy that whiskey uh, also affects uh, the, your sensitivity to the aromas and what you're perceiving. And that's a huge thing, which is why a lot of people claim that uh, the best time of day to taste whiskey is kind of like, uh, and I, don't, I still want to res- I still want to promote responsible drinking here, but uh, one of the best times of day is kind of like 10, 11 a.m., uh, especially around 11 because your, your palate's woken up but it's at its peak, which is why lunch tastes so good. But I don't know. No, I'm just like, but that's the reason is because you're you're right at the peak there, and it's you you haven't been uh, influenced by any sort of heavy dinner or anything like that, or any spices. Your palate's not fatigued throughout the day yet. Um, that's why you. I mean, if you, you'd probably start with a very very plain breakfast of some wheat bix or something, and then um, and then go to go go from there. Um, which is why a tasting panel often meets in the middle of the day, which is great. 
Um, so, uh, so then there's I want to talk about some of the some of the flaws that push up against benchmarks, if you like, and some of the flaws that uh, are talked uh, aren't often talked about in whiskey, but should be things like isovaleric acid. So this is one where there's a smell of things like overripe cheese or uh, like or sweaty uh, sweaty gym sneakers. So that sort of like sweaty smell, that awful sort of sweaty smell, or uh, <laughs> or the or the uh, sweaty cheese. And I don't mean like a good blue cheese that's been out for a couple of hours. I mean like like a a, a waxy kind of cheese that's been sitting in the sun. That's that. It's an isovaleric acid smell that is um, undesirable to whiskey. The second one, of course, is uh, benzaldehyde, uh, which is where you smell things like um, it's almost like a almond, like almond or cherry pit smell and uh it's a it's a little bit different it's a hot it's an almondy smell in spirit now that you might like the idea of an armed note in a whiskey it is not desirable though and it actually uh it does taint the the spirit and the the smell uh and geran oil which is where it's like rose or lemon smells they can be desirable um so uh but it's it's the ice of one i want to i want to focus on there so you also have to and also going back to that genetic comment as well each individual, and when you're tasting these things, everyone has their own strengths and weaknesses in in that. Now, um, with a mate on top of a mountain is my favorite palate context. Makes uh, Journey Red taste good. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to have to take your word for that one. Um, Jeremy, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think I know what you mean, actually. So, um, John Buffard, James Villa, Janice, Jeremy Young. Sally Lau, Colby Whale, Caleb Chan, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Now, I'm going to do a bit of a screen share because I've actually got something really cool to show you. Um, so bear with me here. Um, make sure I do this right because this is kind of cool. And make sure it actually works. Here we go. Uh, cool. That should be working. Okay. So I hope you can all see this. Ah, it is working. Look at that. What we have here is the um, – I'm going to just actually get rid of myself out of this screen for a moment so that um, – uh, so that – you can see just the screen. Hey, look at that. Technology. Okay, so what we have here is the Scotch Whiskey Research Institute, of which the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, the SMWS, is a proud member of. Um, this is the SWRI Flavor Wheel. Now, I'm going to post this up in our Facebook group for you all to actually grab at the end of this stream so you can all download it. It's really useful. Uh, and this is we're going to provide this to members. Uh, I might just zoom in just a little bit more so you can see what we're doing here. It's quite a big file, so it might take a little bit of a on my old computer here to keep keep working. Okay, so have a look at things. Primary tastes uh, wheel here. We've got sort of green, grassy, floral, fruity, solventy, soapy, sweet, woody, nutty, spicy, oily, sour, sulfury, stale. Uh, the primary tastes, the mouth feel, the nasal effects. This is really exciting because this gives us a point of saying, well, work your way out from inside out here into what you're getting. So let's say you say. Oh, yeah, this whiskey smells um, uh, peaty. Okay, I like a peaty whiskey. Let's go out from there. We've got burnt, smoky, and medicinal. So that's a really cool, even just the differentiation right there. And so you often ask beginners, they go, oh, this is peaty. Yeah, it is peaty. Or it's smoky. Okay, it's smoky. But is it peaty or is it smoky? Is it that medicinal kind of smell or is it that kind of smoky smell? Or is it like, you know, burnt wood, burnt ambers, burnt char kind of word smell? That's kind of cool in itself. So let's say it's burnt. So you go, you know, you've got, Tar, char, and ash. That tarry note or char smell or ashy notes. If, if anyone tasted one of those um, English English whiskeys we recently released, 137.6 or something, I think it was. It's still on the website. Great whiskey. Unbelievable, unbelievable whiskey. Um, that's definitely an ashy kind of um, smell in that one. But then you got smoky notes, burning wood, smoked foods, barbecue, bonfire, and medicinal notes, antiseptic, TCP, Carbolic soap first aid kit. Some people don't really like that. I love them. You've got to be in the mood for it, of course. Now, this is this, you can use this for all of them. And you can combine them, of course. So you say, you know, uh, green vegetables, nail varnish remover. That doesn't know no further expansion of that needed. And But here's one you often hear. You hear sweet. Oh, that's something sweet. Okay, what kind of sweetness is it? I'm going to zoom in even more on that one so we can see it. So uh, it's always that whole sort of, uh, you know, what's, uh, oh, I'm getting a sweet note. Yeah, okay, so is it a vanilla sweetness? Is it a uh, honey sweetness, a toffee sweetness? This is really important to sort of to start that differentiation. Um, oh, what does TCP stand for? Good question, Alex. Uh, that one actually, I'm going <laughs> to, I know the smell. I just can't, I can't even remember what TCP actually stands for. 
Uh, <laughs> uh, it's that, you know, that that um, medicinal, that first aid kit smell is why I think of TCP, that, that uh, like that um, antiseptic cream on your own or something. Um, so then you get sweetness, vanilla, honey, and toffee as three very base level sweetness attributes here. But then drill down even further, vanilla pods, ice cream, custard for vanilla. See, that's a really good one. Even just start right there. Vanilla pods, ice cream and custard. It's things like that, which is it a, is it a custard vanilla? It, things like that. Honey, honeycomb, sugar puffs, butterscotch, fudge, brown sugar, treacle for toffee. So this is really important. I'm going to share this in the group uh, for us all to see. Uh, so you can so you can actually use this wheel to your advantage, take advantage of actually, um, and start it when next time you pick up a whiskey, there's so much more you can learn even just from what we've talked about tonight. And this is episode one. This is really exciting about flavor perception, benchmarking, and and uh, faults, taints, and uh, vocabulary. Vocabulary is another category I want to touch on, but I don't think we'll do it tonight. We've gone a little bit over. I'm trying to do at least 30 minutes. Uh, I could talk about this for three hours, but I'm going to enjoy a dram instead. Uh, I really appreciate I really appreciate you all tuning in tonight and being a part of this. Pardon me. As I said, I'm going to um, drop that flavor wheel in the Facebook group, SMWS Australia group, the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society Australia group. Uh, I'm going to drop that as a file in the group for you to all access. That way you can download it, use it as you wish, print it out if you've got a nice big color printer. Uh, and that'll print up to, I think, A1 size. So if you want to... Have it on a huge poster. Thanks to the scientists, uh, Alex Dahlenberg and Rob Akers for their, um, try, you know what? <laughs> I'm putting that one up on screen. <laughs> I knew I wasn't going to remember it on a live stream. Uh, those with Google and, and good brains will remember it. There you go. So in the meantime, um, I want to thank you all again for everything uh, and for being a part of this discussion. This is the first part. And I know tonight we sort of jumped a few categories here, but I'll drill down on those a bit more in the following days. So it's only Wednesday night tonight, which is exciting. And uh, I will see you all. Um, yeah, see you all tomorrow night. In the meantime, uh, look after yourselves. And I will see you all soon. And uh, cheers. Thanks for going. <laughs>